Welcome. Uh, my name is Robbie Weber, and I'm with the State Smart Transportation Initiative. I'm going to give people a little bit more time to log on, but while we're waiting, uh, I do want to do just a little bit of housekeeping here. First of all, uh, I do want to say how excited we are to be presenting this seminar with the National Association of City Transportation Officials, or NACTO. Their urban street guide, urban street design guide, has been generating a lot of interest, and we're very eager to hear what's in the new guide and how cities can use it to improve the urban environment. I know that a lot of people have been waiting for this to come out. Uh, as to our housekeeping here, all the registrants are muted, uh, except for the panelists. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but you can submit questions at any point by typing them into the chat window that's on the left side of your screen. If for some reason you don't see the question box, just click the little orange arrow that's, I'm sorry, it's on the right side of your screen. Click the little orange arrow at the top right of your screen and the chat box will appear. Uh, go ahead and type in questions. We'll then be reading them off at the end of the presentation. Uh, but if something occurs to you, go ahead and uh, submit it. The webinar itself is being recorded, so if you missed anything or you want to pass this on to other people, you'll be able to access it later today. We will also have the slides up by themselves uh, if you just want to look at the slides or download them. For those who are not familiar with SSTI, uh, we are um, I just want to give you a little information, and you can find more information about us at our website, which is ssti.us. We are a network of reform-oriented state DOTs. Uh, we were founded in 2010, and we are housed at the University of Wisconsin. We work in three different ways. First, as a community of practice where participating agencies can learn together and share experiences as they implement innovative smart transportation policies. We also serve as a source of direct technical assistance to agencies on smart transportation reform efforts. And finally, we act as a resource to the wider transportation community, including local, and state, and federal agencies in their efforts to practice changing social and financial, uh, I'm sorry, efforts to reorient their practices uh, to changing social and financial demands. And that's where this comes in. We do have webinars uh, every month except for December and August. We have a newsletter. We have a Twitter account. We have our website with a lot of great resources. So I uh, well um, invite you to check those out. And I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists for today. Joining us are David Vega Barakowitz, who is the director at the Designing Cities Initiative at NACTO. He'll be speaking first. He'll be followed by Michael Flynn, the director of capital planning at New York City DOT. And finally, Peter Kuntz, who is the division manager, the signals division, at the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And I'm sure everyone would like to hear from our three panelists instead of me. So I'm just going to get out of their way and let them speak. And I'm going to turn over uh, control to David. Thank you very much. You're muted. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and thank you to SSTI for, for hosting this webinar with us. We're really Really excited to have the opportunity to present on the Urban Street Design Guide to this audience and um, really to continue to work with you um, on, on some of the, the, the really common initiatives that we have uh, as, as a coalition. Um, for today's presentation, um, we're going to have three speakers. Uh, I'll start by just giving a little bit of background and some overview of sort of the driving principles behind the Urban Street Design Guide for context. Uh, and then we're going to have Michael Flynn uh, delve a little bit more into one of the really important and kind of new sections uh, in the guide, which is the Interim Design Strategies chapter. Um, and after Mike speaks, Peter Koontz from the City of Portland 
we'll discuss the design controls chapter to give people a little bit of a taste of some of the important work that goes into that. Since kicking off its Cities for Cycling initiative in 2009 uh, and the Designing Cities initiative in 2012, NACDO has really um, cemented its leadership in, in putting out city and urban street design standards. In 2011, we released the first edition of the Urban Bikeway Design Guide, the document left. And today um, and, and this month, this fall, we really have an opportunity um, to kind of move the, 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 raise the bar to the next level with the Urban Street Design Guide. Part of the reason that these guides are really critical is because they counterbalance a legacy of street design guides that's just really significantly weighted, um, that's significantly weighted towards rural and suburban highway design standards. We're really in the process of moving from a paradigm of seeing city streets as a kind of anomaly and an afterthought towards a kind of celebration of their really unique design characteristics while recognizing the continued need for balance and public space. Um, these three manuals, the Highway Capacity Manual, the MUTCD, and the Ashto Green Book are really what's been driving uh, the sort of the anchors of street design guidance at the national level since the interstate era. Um, and, uh, you know, our coalition really saw a need to have a, a set of design guides uh, that more directly addressed uh, urban design issues. Before putting out the street design guide, however, the impulse to write a new guidebook had already begun uh, kicking off in individual cities that are within our membership. And within the last um, five, ten years, a number of really important design guides at the local level have been released, including the New York City Street Design Manual, which first came out in 2010 and is now uh, in its second edition, and the Boston Complete Streets Design Guidelines, which came out in 2012. Um, these guides complemented work by groups like ITE and the Congress for New Urbanism, which have been pushing things in the right direction but didn't always have the implementation to back them up. All of these guides have really been part of a kind of larger effort to create real spaces for people on city streets um, that have been really spearheaded by pioneer cities like New York City that have been using low-cost materials like planters, bollards, and markings to really realize the benefits of folk reconstruction in the short term. Um, this is a great example of one of those kinds of projects that's emerged quite recently. Uh, this is Union Square in, in Manhattan, New York City. Um, other projects, uh, this sort of set of tactical sort of low-cost solutions to retrofitting city streets has been spreading recently to other cities around the country. This is a um, an arterial in Atlanta that was recently retrofitted to have a two-way cycle track. Sorry, there's just a little bit of delay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, beginning with the Cities for Cycling project in 2009, NACDO um, really began to sort of set a new set of national standards in street design. This was really our first foray into design guidance. Um, the 2011 edition of the Bike Guide uh, was really oriented around finding a way for American cities to take world-class um, best practices in bikeway design and translate them to an American context. Many cities that had wanted to use Copenhagen-style bikeways like the one above had found that the majority of engineers around the country wouldn't design um, streets like this for lack of guidance and fear of liability, but would gladly call a paved shoulder an appropriate bicycle facility. The bike guide translated real world innovative projects that were happening in a few leading cities around the country like the Market Street Cycle Track in San Francisco, into a standard set of treatments that could be applied in cities around the nation. At the same time, 
the guide presented this information in a really unique and dynamic format, both online and in print, um, and for the first time really represented an opportunity for the city, for a coalition of city transportation officials to come together and not only change the game at the local level, but at the national level. The bike guide quickly cemented, um, set off a string of projects all around the country, even just here. You can see Atlanta, Austin, Salt Lake City, and Charlotte, all projects that came out within a year of the guide's release. In 2011, in October, Secretary Hood endorsed the guide, signaling a way forward for transportation officials really around the country to embrace and implement it. And in late, this just this past August, in late August, FHWA issued a memorandum which officially endorsed the design guide and distributed copies to their division of offices all around the country. But the bike guide was really only one aspect of a much larger set of issues concerning U.S. cities and their streets. And the tools, the performance measures and the day-to-day -day practices of most city transportation departments remained rooted in an interstate era approach to highway design, which was predicated on making streets wider, more forgiving to rush hour traffic, and consequently much less pedestrian friendly. The Urban Street Design Guide, like the Bike Guide, is really rooted in NACTO's core mission of advancing the state of the practice through peer-to-peer -peer exchange. But whereas the Bike Guide filled a pretty clear niche, the Street Design Guide really deals with a much wider range of transportation issues um, and uh, impacts multiple agencies within a city. The guide has six chapters, um, each of which deals with street design at uh, a different scale. Um, these include streets, street design elements, um, that's another delay, interim design strategies, intersections, intersection design elements, and design controls. And again, Mike will talk about inter interim design strategies, and Peter will talk about design controls a little later. Like the bike guide, the urban street design guide really uses a kind of rich, dynamic, visual platform to communicate um, different lessons about urban street design and takes lessons that have been pioneered in NACTO cities around the country and makes the sort of secret sauce available to cities all over the U.S. To keep the guide a kind of living document, we've built an interactive, really easy to use website which has additional materials, photos, and resources for people. And that also includes um, additional case studies and photographs that are going to be updated to reflect the state of the practice. Just as the bike guide translated a kind of real-world um, exemplary projects uh, into standards, the street design guide does the same thing, but really looks at how street design affects all users, including transit, pedestrians, vehicles, and bikes. The guide includes um, several relatively new topics. Um, these include uh, shared streets. And just a little bit of a delay here, um, shared streets like this, and creates a set of design standards around them, which, um, which kind of begin to share some emerging best practices on those subjects. We're taking best practices from all around the country, um, like this uh, pedestrian plaza, which, is in, uh, which was done in Philadelphia last year, um, and transforming them into standards that cities all around the country can use. Sorry again for the delay. I'm not quite sure why it's um, so slow. Um, like the bike guide, the street design guide really uh, pushes the envelope by highlighting projects which have made a kind of outstanding impact on the landscape of transportation and street design and really demerge, uh, deserve to sort of emerge as standards for city streets. Um, the guide has three levels of guidance, including critical, uh, uh, critical recommendations, uh, recommended practices, and optional, which is very much parallel um, to something that you'd see in a variety of guidebooks, including the NACTO bike guide. And the guide is really anchored by sort of six 
overarching design principles. Um, I'm just going to go through these before I pass up the mic really quickly. First and foremost, um, you know, we really think that it's crucial that people are looking at streets as public spaces. We see, we see streets as potential, uh, potentially uh, great generators for higher revenues for businesses and higher values for homeowners. We fundamentally believe that streets and their, their sort of geometric proportions have the ability to be changed. Um, again, I think this is a great example from the city of Atlanta. We also believe that there's um, tremendous value in designing for safety and sort of using safety as a really driving design parameter. That streets need to be thought of as ecosystems um, and that the guide has this really uh, a, a great series of chapters focusing on stormwater management, which directly address um, address this principle. And last but not least, uh, the sort of general principle that cities really do have the agency to act now to begin to sort of mark out the future of future curb line and create really active, loved public space in the near term. The guide depicts streets in three stages of transformation. Uh, these include uh, the sort of before conditions, um, the striping and sort of low cost solutions for city streets, which I've mentioned. And you can see in some of the projects that I showed pictures of earlier. And sort of the ultimate evolution of a street once uh, a city has the opportunity to go in and do a full reconstruction. There's also um, there's also a significant amount of emphasis on sort of understanding a street's uh, design in terms of its context, and we really use uh, a sort of the, the sort of visual material in the guide to show how a street should and must respond to its very specific context. Um, this is a street that's kind of going from more of a strip mall arterial kind of context through a residential setting and then into a downtown. Now, um, before I uh, turn things over to Mike Flynn, uh, I'd just like to sort of outline a few of the things that we're going to be doing uh, in terms of our rollout for the street design guide over the next few months. Um, one of the things that we had an opportunity to do in 2012 and then again in 2013 was bring together NACTO's whole entire peer-to-peer peer -peer coalition uh, for a series of, of workshops and discussion on, discussion on emerging best practices. This is uh, a photo of Michael Bloomberg speaking at our 2012 design, uh, Designing Cities conference in New York. But one of the really crucial things that we're going to be doing is similar to our endorsement campaign for the Urban Bikeway Design Guide, which we did in 2011, we're going to be doing a significant amount of direct outreach to city transportation officials all around the country. And as part of that, on October 29th, we kicked off an endorsement campaign for the Urban Street Design Guide, really calling on elected officials, transportation directors, um, city engineers and state engineers all around the country to uh, review and hopefully endorse the guide or adopt the guide uh, to really begin to embed these principles um, and and to, to sort of spread some of these important lessons um, throughout the profession. One last thing for anyone who's on the call today, um, we do have a 20% discount using the promo code through uh, that's listed here through Island Press. Uh, and I also just want to thank um, those who supported the guide, including the Rockefeller Foundation and the Summit Foundation. Um, now I'd just like to introduce Michael Flynn, the Director of Capital Planning at New York City DOT. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do my darndest uh, to time these slide transitions. Uh, but there is a little delay, like David mentioned. So 
I'm going to talk about what I think is one of the most interesting and important uh, sections of the guide, this interim design strategies chapter. Uh, it, it really presents information that uh, doesn't currently exist anywhere in a, in a real usable format. Um, I think David used the term the secret sauce that a lot of cities are, are having success you know, with these strategies. So I, I want to use this act now um, principle as the jumping off point for that because I think there is an imperative uh, for cities um, to use in, uh, street design as, as one important tool in um, accommodating growth, in fostering sustainability, livability, and to not really always let the perfect be the enemy of the good and to not wait till 10 years from now. So with that in mind, here are some of the things that we all deal with when we're doing long-term projects that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, we basically need each of these to fall into place before we can move forward. We need to get the funding uh, rounded up. We need to build support from the public and from businesses, from elected officials. And we have to get all kinds of approvals um, that, you know, depending on the circumstances, can be the toughest part. Uh, whether it's of, um, I guess, what you call non-standard designs or, um, or, or different kinds of environmental approvals that are linked to um, assumptions about future conditions. Um, historically, we've basically had two approaches to, to implement improvements to our streets. We've had this short-term approach that's basically just kind of our traffic control device toolbox of uh, signs, signals, and markings. And then that long-term kind of everything in the kitchen sink. In New York, we've wondered if there's more we can do in the short term by kind of expanding that, um, that toolbox um, you know, and save time and money. So you can do a lot with signs, signals, and markings. And we've tried to get uh, as creative as we can. And, and plenty of, uh, of cities are, are doing the same with things like road diets, like you see here. But we added some tools beyond that um, and started experimenting with that, let's say, you know, around 2006 or so. And over the last seven or eight years, we added in planters and trees, landscaping, um, and street furniture, movable and fixed. And that, you know, started kind of simply, but then moved into more sophisticated designs. Get some photos here. So here's one of our earlier projects, Willoughby Plaza in downtown Brooklyn. You can see that we just left the road exactly as it is. Maybe it's not a lot to look at. We got some off-the-shelf furniture, things like that. But it was a huge success, and it's really helped to transform the surrounding retail frontages. Um, as time went by, we, we kind of got even more innovative and looked at things like how we paint lanes for bikes and buses other kinds of innovative surface treatments like epoxy gravel or uh, painting the roadbed, um, use of stones, boulders, things that don't require construction like many bollards in order to provide a barrier, uh, and, and some surface level concrete work that doesn't really require full scale uh, coordination and, and design. So here's an example of a project that uses just about every uh, item in that toolkit. Uh, this is Madison Square, a Flatiron plaza, plaza right by the Flatiron Building. You can see the furniture, the uh, tables, chairs, umbrellas, planters, epoxy gravel surface, green bike lanes, um, and, and those kinds of things. And there's a lot you can do. And this didn't take years. You know, it, it basically took, let's say, a month of, of study and planning and design um, and a cost in the thousands, not the millions. And when we talk about design, we don't want to lose sight of the other side of the coin uh, when it comes to doing quick improvements to our streets, which is sort of the management and operations side. You know, how do we use that street over the course of a day, over the course of a year, um, and, and how do we get creative in terms of how it's used beyond just uh, redesigning it? So all of these. Um, all these feed into the interim design strategies chapter. They're all kind of a toolkit you can work with. Uh, you can see here some of the pros and cons of each approach. So I, I would call this an interim approach versus a full construction approach. Interim, uh, you can do in months, costs them tens of thousands typically, requires fewer approvals. On the other hand, you have a little bit less creative leeway um, in terms of what you can design with, with this sort of more interim toolkit. Um, and the impact is not as long-term because it'll have a shorter useful life. 
On the other hand, construction will take longer, will cost quite a bit more, will require quite a few uh, more approvals, and, uh, and, but basically gives you free reign in terms of the design. Some of the benefits in summary of, of this interim approach are that it quickly allows you to demonstrate the project, um, to, to see the benefits, to reallocate the space, to prove that it works, both to the public and to elected officials and to all the other key stakeholders. It allows you time to build support from the public and, and political support, and it also, I guess, buys you time to, um, to raise more money, no pun intended. So kind of the, the logical, oh, this is just a, a, an example of that. You know, you, you can get very creative doing interim things. This is Times Square uh, in New York, maybe sort of the um, epitome of, of the approach we've been doing over the last few years. But even here, you know, um, a temporary treatment will only get you so far. Eventually, you do want to make it permanent. So this is a rendering of what's in construction right as we speak. Uh, the first phases of the permanent build-out will be done. Uh, actually, the ribbon cutting, I believe, will be very soon. So the logical conclusion of this, and this is a graphic from the Street Design Guide, is this sort of phased approach to uh, implementing projects. Instead of the long-term start to finish, we can still stay on that track, but we can do the interim implementation in the meantime uh, for all the reasons I just talked about. Uh, and, and this is basically the approach that we've been taking in New York um, pretty successfully to, to tee up projects and to get things in the ground and to, to see if it works and to tweak it if we need to. Um, or even in the worst case, if it didn't work, you could always take it back out um, before you, you build something permanently. So now I'm going to step through the, uh, the interim design strategies chapter. These are a few slides that, um, that David showed earlier about how the guide as a whole emphasizes this transition from the existing to the interim to the permanent build out. Just wait for the slide to update here. Sorry about the delay. The, uh, the interim design strategies chapter is divided into four overall sections, moving the curb, parklets, temporary street closures, and interim public plazas. And there's a lot of uh, meat in there for each of these. Uh, I want to walk through them. And, and just to provide a lens, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've implemented each of these in New York, um, since that's what I'm most familiar with. But I know plenty of other cities have um, been moving ahead with these types of approaches and, and even been in the lead. You know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that some of these ideas we, we gladly stole from other places. Um, I know San Francisco was really um, upfront with some of the parklets and um, you know uh, Portland and other cities out on the West Coast uh, with the bike corrals. So interim sidewalk widening uh, refers to just this idea that you know to permanently widen the sidewalk can actually require a lot of work. Uh, you may need to move underground utilities, you have to deal with drainage, you may need to move your catch basins. Um, and, and that can cost a lot and it can take a lot of time, but we shouldn't let that stop us from doing traffic calming and from creating new public space. So the guide divides this approach into a few kind of subcategories. Um, these are some examples from New York. On the left you can see kind of a lower cost or maybe more straightforward approach. Uh, this is a pro project in the Bronx. We just used the flexible plastic delineators and some planters to widen the sidewalks. You can't really see it here, but at rush hour, uh, the sidewalks are jammed because this is a huge bus to subway transfer point. Uh, a few years later, on the right is that picture of Union Square that David showed, where you know we've we've gotten a little bit more creative in terms of the furniture and the the things we use to divide the traffic, the green bike lanes, things like that. But it's the same basic approach. This would cost, you know, Union Square to build that permanently would probably cost upwards of $5 million just for that area. Uh, another approach for moving the curb is uh, traffic calming. Uh, you see a lot of these examples like the photo on the right and the rendering where basically um, you can build an island instead of actually connecting it to the curb, which allows you to avoid dealing with drainage. 
um, and quickly reap some of those benefits in terms of uh, slowing traffic and visually narrowing the roadway. Here's an example in New York where we did what we call Six and a Half Avenue, which is basically a um, pedestrian connection connecting a series of privately owned public spaces, arcades, plazas, those kinds of things. Um, but there didn't used to be legal mid-block crossings, so if you wanted to sort of wind your way through, there wasn't really a way. We added these mid-block crossings, and we did these temporary narrowings um, to sort of emphasize that mid-block crossing, and, and we were able to do it very quickly. Bike corrals are pretty straightforward. Uh, plenty of cities are doing these now. It's another, you know, especially in areas where the sidewalk is really high value real estate and is congested, you don't want to locate a lot of these other appurtenances there like bike parking. So the parking lane is a logical place for it. If we can park our cars there, why can't we park our bikes there? Next up, here's a few photos from New York of bike corrals. Next up, bike share, very similar idea. Um, I, I, I think as much can be said, that can be said about it has been said, but um, you know, in those cities that are doing bike share, this is certainly a good way to, uh, to move the curve out. Again, a couple of photos from, uh, from New York. So that takes us through moving the curb. Next up are parklets. Um, Parklets, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, are basically these um, temporary platforms or modular platforms that can be used to, to functionally extend the sidewalk into the parking lane and, and basically uh, you know, expand the amount of public space for either cafe seating or public seating. You've seen these a lot in Europe, and now you're seeing them around the US. The guide has very detailed uh, design and uh, siting and operational guidance on parklets. Um, you know, everything from the dimensions to necessary considerations for maintenance. Um, here in New York, our program is called Street Seats uh, for parklets. And it's an application-based program like a lot of these are here. And I'll talk a little bit more later about you know, the benefits of, of using application-based programs. You can see some of the criteria here. Uh, we expect the applicants, which are typically one or more businesses, to come to us and have already given some thought to this. We want to make sure that they're really committed, uh, that they're committed to maintaining it, that it's a, a logical place to put it, and that that kind of support exists. couple of examples from New York. Um, a key thing you can see in the picture in the upper right is we, we emphasize to the public that, that it's public space. It's not dedicated to the customers of a particular business, even if that business is, is the um, committed maintenance partner. You know, it's really open to anybody. So we, we want to be clear that public space remains public space. Um, the next category is temporary street closures. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of different approaches fall under this category, but the overarching theme is um, reimagining our streets over the course of the day or over the course of the year in terms of what different uses can they serve, um, you know, where we're really getting the most value from them. At certain times of day, maybe you know, during rush hours, the best value is to move a lot of cars. Uh, at other times of day or other days of the week or days of the year, Maybe they're serving their highest and best purpose uh, in other ways, by providing public space, by um, encouraging more retail business patronage. One type of temporary street closure are what we call play streets, which are sort of a specific category that are oriented to uh, children. So they're often around schools or playgrounds or parks. Um, and they're typically closed during the hours of the day that um, the children will be around, so during school hours or maybe on the weekends at parks. Um, our program in New York is run through our Police Athletic League, actually, and, and they basically um, help program it and implement it with putting the barriers up and things like that. Next up are pedestrian streets, um, and it's a more general category for, um, for you know, what we might think of historically as street festivals or street fairs, but trying to broaden that concept, I guess, from maybe some people think of tube socks and, and, and Italian sausages or things like that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with them, 
but uh, you know, how, how can we do this in a way that really is reflective of the local community and uh, helps the local businesses and, and reflects what's going on there in the neighborhood. So again, our programs tend to be application-based, um, and, and in that way we can ensure that they are reflective of the local community. You can see a few examples here. Uh, the one in the lower left is in the East Village, so you have a, a strong a creative component. There's a performer there right on the street. Uh, the one in the middle is from a more residential neighborhood in Queens, and the one in the upper right is from Bastille Day uh, in uh, sort of a French-ish neighborhood in Brooklyn, and, and they actually put sand in the road and play patank, which is sort of like bocce, I guess a French equivalent. It's a lot of fun. Markets, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, we think about farmers markets and how we leverage them um, in, uh, to um, create more dynamism and, and more of a destination on the street, make more of a sense of place. Markets are definitely something we want to leverage. So it makes sense to consider either temporary or permanent street closures uh, adjacent to, to different kinds of markets to provide more space or to allow the market to grow. And finally, open streets are kind of the, the big um, granddaddy of the category. Uh, it's when we think of Ciclavia or Ciclavia in Los Angeles or summer streets here in New York, basically major street closures to, to vehicular traffic or open to pedestrian traffic, uh, oftentimes program with activities um, to the, with the goal of encouraging active recreation, exercise, as well as some of those economic benefits. Uh, in New York, we do Summer Streets, which basically connects the Brooklyn Bridge to Central Park uh, over about a seven-mile distance. Uh, it's heavily programmed, runs up Lafayette Street, Park Avenue, goes through all different neighborhoods. We have all kinds of uh, cultural, recreational, and physical activities. Here's a photo of that looking up in Midtown. Um, each. Uh, successive year, we tried to get more and more creative in terms of how we program it. So last year we had things like zip lines, um, traditional dancing classes. We had a huge art installation in a tunnel that's normally only open to vehicles. That was a light and sound installation uh, for pedestrians to walk through. And the last category in the chapter is interim public plazas. So basically the idea of public plazas, how can we do them quicker? How can we get them in the ground and see if they work? Again, there's a lot of really detailed design guidance, um, and uh, I'll, I'll gloss over the details there, but uh, it's worth taking a look. It's really the first time that th these kinds of um, strategies have been detailed somewhere. So to wrap up, I'll talk a little bit about our plaza program in New York. Uh, it, it's also an application-based program. And even more than that, it's a, it's a competitive program um, where we really want to target neighborhoods of the highest need um, and where there's really a strong um, proven commitment on the part of the community that, that they want to be a partner here. This is that example in Philadelphia that uh, David showed. Go, go to webinar. Okay. So this is uh, this is a map showing New York City and basically giving you a sense of how we prioritize the plazas. We really want to prioritize areas that ha have a, a lack of open space, basically as measured by publicly accessible open space per capita and areas that are low to moderate income. So the orange on the map represents that area of overlap that both have a lack of open space and are low to moderate income. On top of that, we have other criteria that we look at. These are our selection criteria. Uh, we want to see demonstrated community initiative in terms of activities that they're already programming on the site. Uh, community board approval, that's sort of our local um, advisory boards. Uh, appropriate context that's really going to support a plaza and make sure that it sees good usage um, and capacity on the part of the uh, organization to be a maintenance partner and, and, you know, for the long haul. 
We do pretty in-depth public outreach, uh, including charrettes, where we invite members of the public to talk about what they'd like to see, both from a design and programming perspective. And this is how we basically apportion responsibilities between the city and a maintenance partner. The city does the heavy lifting in terms of initial capital funding, uh, the design of the site, um, construction, all, all those technical things. And basically, the maintenance partner is our partner in designing it, in doing outreach, and then once it's built, they really take it and run with it in terms of maintenance, insurance, programming it, um, and funding the ongoing maintenance. To do that, they're allowed to raise money that can be specifically funneled back into the maintenance. They can do sub-concessions like food vendors. They can do limited sponsorships. You can, uh, th that can be either private or charitable. You can see the example on the top, some of the planters were sponsored. Um, and they can do commercial events that, that sort of fall under limited sponsorship as well. But that money must be directed back into maintenance of the site. And that partnership is key to ensure success. That's, that's basically been our lesson here. So I will end it on that note, and uh, I guess we'll turn it over to Peter. Thank okay. you. Well, I'm uh, uh, covering design controls. A lot of things that uh, just were described were really those kind of the, the short-term things. I want to talk a little bit about longer-term issues associated with the design of projects and some of the some of the assumptions that go into those projects. The the design guide is covers essentially a lot of different things in design controls, and the design controls portion is actually in the in the back of the document because it's really important as we did that on purpose because it's really important to make sure that the muted you start with the you begin with the end in mind and really you should be thinking about what you're trying to design rather than the assumptions you shouldn't let the assumptions push you towards a particular type of facility uh, we like to say that high quality design for C streets and intersections rely on a keen understanding of the analytical processes and assumptions underlying those technical decisions that shape streets. And I'll go over those and talk to you a little bit about how uh, we've faced that in Portland and how we've kind of tried to uh, insert some of that experience into the guide and share that with others. And, and I'll talk a little bit about those aspects of how um, the guide does have a little different take than some of the other more established documents. Again, design control should work towards your intended outcome and not against it. So let's start with design hour. And design hour is really important for the basis of design. It's really, uh, you can you start with that assumption from, a, from an engineering standpoint of this is what we're going to study. We're going to study this hour. The engineer brings those traffic volumes to the table and looks at the looks at the practice of, uh, of what would happen from a, from how the intersection would work. Um, I've been doing this with the city of Portland. We actually look at a two-hour peak period of traffic, and we use the highway capacity manual peak hour factor to focus in on the peak 15 minutes of traffic. So if you think about that in terms of the nature of the assessment, um, it sometimes it creates the less than urbane places uh, because we're really trying to just focus on on that, we're focusing on that peak 15 minutes because that's what our design standards have told us. In fact, just to contrast the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide with the Ashto Green Book, the Ashto Green Book goes so far as to say that in urban design, the 30th highest hourly volume can be a reasonable representation of daily peak hour. Well, if you think about that, that 30th highest hourly volume, that represents the peak 0.34% of the time on the street throughout the year. So some people say we're designed for the 8th percentile. We're actually, with traffic volumes, we're actually designing for the 99.6%. And so that's where NACTO looks at this a little bit differently. NACTO looks at the uh, silent on the issue of 30th highest hour and leaves that to the discretion of the analyst, but asks the question whether we should be looking at peak 15 minutes or rather looking at peak spreading opportunities and trying to determine whether there's really the opportunity to create space where people are going to as opposed to space that facilitates people moving through at a high rate of speed. So that's 
part and parcel to a difference in the different guides and, and how uh, we're trying to create urban spaces as, as they have done a fantastic job in New York City, as, as you saw from the examples uh, from the previous presentation. So the Urban Street Design Guide introduced the, the concept of a day in the life of a street and encourages consideration of everything that we do from a transportation operating agency, whether it be traffic signal timing, which is my, my, uh, my uh, task at the city of Portland, to on-street parking regulation, uh, transit and HOV lane use, uh, really to foster multimodal transportation that is beneficial to cities and not just cars. So uh, we think about this in terms of how this manifests itself on the on the on the ground. Really, streets are designed for peak intervals of traffic. The tre streets that are designed for peak intervals of traffic may fail to provide a safe and attractive environment during other portions of the day. It's something that um, certainly you think about um, some of our downtowns, and Portland is is no exception to this. That uh, we really. Uh, tried to focus historically on mobility in that morning peak hour and, and in the afternoon noon peak hour um, with not much emphasis on that noon time or 8 p.m. Uh, portion. I think in, the, in downtown Portland we're, we're pretty lucky actually that we've had some success with trying to create spaces that are, that are good for the lunch hour. I think the, the piece that remains is, is trying to create a 24-hour uh, downtown that, uh, that so many so many of us have been focusing on and seeing the things that are happening in, in New York City and other communities uh, across across the country. So that's really some of the differences in, in the design hour. I want to take you now to the design year because that's another aspect of this that, again, uh, as I've as I've worked across the country, you obviously have uh, that we have to design for the projection of future traffic demands and, and thinking about that in the context of the central city, uh, the future traffic demands, we may actually want to try to reduce the amount of traffic that's coming through a downtown uh, to create more of a there there, just like I talked about in the design hour. It might be that in, in recreating the city that you have more residential activity as opposed to more vehicular traffic, a novel, a novel concept uh, that has been talked about for years and years, just never uh, in, the, in as a lead from a transportation um, standards handbook, as, such as such as the Urban Street Design Guide is. So, if you think about this projection of of traffic demands, really in the past 30, 40 years, it's been driven by the need to accommodate um, the highway demand. And thinking about it from a from a, a traffic standpoint, the Ashto the Ashto Green Book talks about. Um, the maximum design period of 15 to 25 years, and, and in Portland we're, we're we're modeling out to 2035 now. So I guess that is in that range. But certainly, the traffic projections are analyzed in relation to existing performance measures. So thinking about it in terms of volume to capacity, not so much these other measures that I'll talk about in a bit that are really changing the game in terms of how we think about our streets. So the models are assuming an unconstrained amount of growth and traffic, and the ability for the transportation network is essentially trying to be expanded to accommodate that, that movement of, of vehicles. When in reality, uh, we've been seeing this for the past 15 years, and this is an example from the Sightline Institute. Uh, it's out of, out of the Seattle area that's, that looked at a project that said, well, gosh, the, we've, we've had three different forecasts of those those travel demand models, and, and we, we had a forecast that you know showed this sloping line that went to the right and showed increasing traffic, but the actual trend was actually down, and that's partially a function of our changing demographics and, of course, the economy, but maybe it's time to start thinking about these design year uh, growth patterns a little bit differently. So rather than thinking about unconstrained vehicle demand, that, that, that interest in what uh, in driving may be changing that the we don't and there's a lot of questions that remain about what is the cost of gas uh, in 2035 and, and did young people still want to drive so those various aspects are come to question when we think about the future of cities and of course the the nature of the design year that we want to try to focus in and and the those urban design year volumes um, 
sometimes leaves a lot of necessary unnecessary space for the urban realm that that hampers redevelopment. This is an example uh, in Portland where we uh, you know you, you, we've kept that space. We we have a very generous uh, curb radius there, and it really is uh, something that we reserved for future capacity. And so that's something that uh, cities and state DOTs need to rethink as we as we move forward. If we think about the importance of the urban fabric in our in our communities. So in Portland, we're looking at the design year a little bit differently. We're looking at it under the I call it the climate lens. The climate action plan it was something that the city and the, the county uh, here worked on jointly to uh, try to figure out if there was uh, other performance measures that we should be targeting as a, as a goal. And, and we, we landed on, of course, greenhouse gases. And uh, it's, it's uh, particularly telling, considering that just uh, two weeks ago, the uh, World Meteorological Organization released a report that described that the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere reached a new record in 2012. So it's something that we have been uh, focused on in Portland for the last uh, last few years, and have have made a dent in by having the climate action plan suggest a transportation hierarchy. Now, this isn't in our transportation system plan yet. That's a that's a logical next step. But thinking about it in terms of prioritizing our streets for pedestrians, of course, uh, bicycle traffic, public transit, commercial vehicles, and then high occupancy vehicles. And last, but uh, I guess least, uh, single occupant vehicles. So trying to think about how do you create more activity in downtown? Well, you get get people to downtown by creating more efficient forms of transportation as a means to get people to where you want to go, where they where they want to go. And of course, the bus and and bicycles are, are great in that uh, in, in doing that. So I want to leave you uh, just with a performance measures portion before I. Uh, before I include the design controls element, and I, I, as an engineer, I like to measure things and meet targets. Uh, really, anything with numbers motivates me. And the performance measure or definition of failure is really uh, in transportation is really driven by um, other elements of civil engineering. And, and the structural engineering uh, is, of course, we we know a failure when we see one. When the Skagit River Bridge, a quite a tragedy, but certainly uh, one of those that you can. Everybody, I think, can agree that this is failure in a classic sense. We never want this sort of failure. But if you if you change that perspective, look at transportation, um, different performance measures come up. And so we have different potential performance measures. And uh, the one that's used most often, and Portland is, uh, is, is uses this for signalized intersections, is delay per vehicle at, at a signalized intersection. Uh, there are other measures, uh, crashes per mile of highway and, and mode split. Those are different measures that are in these various documents there. And I'll, I'll talk about the ones that are most important to Portland. Well, in, in Portland, we've been focused on uh, the uh, bike traffic across the bridges as a, as, a, as a key motivating performance measure. If we can see that traffic, bicycle traffic is growing, we know we're, we're doing a, a reasonably good job of, of making uh, basically more attractive. So this is from the guide to sustainable transportation performance measures, but quite a different, quite a quite a different uh, measure than what most agencies are using, which is the highway capacity mail, which would define failure as 80 seconds of delay at a signalized intersection per vehicle. So this contrast of what is the right measure is discussed in the guide, and the the question uh, that you have to ask is what what performance measure is is your city or your state or your agency looking at trying to trying to tackle? Obviously, 80 seconds of delay at a traffic signal for vehicles for for cars, and not not even considering pedestrians or bike traffic, is is not quite the measure that might get us to mode split targets, which are again defined in our climate action plan. And but we have today we have a bike mode split. Um, uh, in 8% of 8% walking at 4% in 2030 to meet our climate action plan goals, we were seeking to triple that bike mode split to 25%, uh, double the walking mode split to 7.5%. Now those are those are uh, those are goals that are aspirational. I like to say uh, I, I, it's a, we have a big steps to to get there, but that's something that if you think about designing for the future, designing for a future peak year. Uh, Thinking about tripling the bike 
mode split and tripling the number of bikes on the street today, it does make you think about what sorts of facilities we need to be building for bike, bike traffic for pedestrians as a part of the design process. So there's a slide about the high capacity mail looking at the breakdown of flow, 80 seconds per vehicle as opposed to boy, thinking about it in terms of what we need from a pedestrian standpoint. In the high capacity mail, pedestrians are modeled as impediments to traffic impacting flow. Uh, pedestrian delay isn't considered in that performance measure. It, it talks about delay per vehicle. Uh, and not necessarily person delay. So that's one step that as an agency you could make tomorrow is just say instead of vehicle delay, we want to look at person delay for for the uh, for the transportation network and the transportation decision making that we do. Um, certainly including uh, consideration of bike delay or pedestrian delay as a part of that. Um, but today our vehicle standards largely do not accept 80 seconds of delay and and uh, there's no real procedure to consider a second of delay for pedestrians. One of the things that often is done is a restriction of pedestrian crossing movements, which really, again, um, defeats the purpose in terms of if you're trying to prioritize pedestrians on the street or at the at the traffic signal. So if you think about it uh, as a performance measure by mode, you can certainly break that out, and that's what the that's what the Urban Street Design Guide does. Is it asks you that question of how are you considering all the various movements and all the various modes there, and, and what is the what is the net uh, what is the net effect of these streetscape questions, uh, streetscape uh, decisions that you're making? The um, sorry, I skipped a slide there. The uh, I want to just give credit to New York City uh, and this pedestrian plaza is a, a great example. Of, uh, and, and the per resulting performance measures are great examples of what what they have done and something that we are taking a close look at in Portland is trying to figure out as opposed to just using delay per vehicle how do we how do we reduce crashes what are the what are the implications of, of improving safety and and how do we measure that with our projects um, what do we do about reduced speeding and increased fatality as an engineer as a traffic engineer uh, I didn't necessarily think I'd be working on projects where I was trying to reduce the percentage of, of commercial vacancies, but that's a measure that, that New York City has used in this document uh, measuring the street. So I'd, if you haven't seen that already, I'd encourage you to, to, to look that up. Finally, um, thinking about it in terms of a system as opposed to our point analyses, that's one of the other limitations of some of our existing performance measures is we tend to look at that intersection and not uh, look at the broader system. We don't think about the completeness of the system. Um, so there's there's that aspect that uh, you know most transportation networks are a system, and sometimes if you have a, a failure in the classic sense of 80 seconds of delay at that one congested intersection, it may not be that you need to make uh, a widen that intersection. You may just need to consider a broader a broader scale uh, for for the transportation problem that you're trying to address. So applying the Urban Street Design Guide, I want, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. I want you to think about um, how you challenge assumptions and especially considering um, the engineering details. And so that's the Urban Street Design Guide, I think, tries to provide uh, access to the details of, uh, that, that we hold, we hold, uh, as, uh, we hold true uh, to and, and trying to think about uh, those details differently. Um, we, we, we believe strongly that engineers don't have a monopoly on solutions. I can I can say that as an engineer. I, I don't I don't know if you give me a different performance measure than my trip traditional uh, traffic signal delay measure that I've tried to do my level best to minimize as, as I've as I've gone in my career. It's it's something that uh, we don't we don't know exactly all those elements of what will make a successful city. So you have to challenge those assumptions and try to uh, take responsibility for those details so that we. Uh, we can trump those traditional practices. And with that, I will Unmuted. I'll hand it back over. Um, I thank you for your time and uh, welcome, welcome questions as we uh, as we continue this dialogue about the Urban Street Design Guide. Well, wow, thank you all so much. This was just a fantastic uh, set of ideas and uh, lots to think about. Um, I will re remind people that we will be taking questions. And if you haven't entered your question, you can do so by typing it in, 
into the chat box. You may need to like uh, click on the little orange arrow in the upper right hand corner to find the chat box. But uh, we will um, take some questions. I'm just going to kind of pull out my little question box here so that I can read them. Uh, and we have a lot of questions. Um, so I'll start with one that I guess I also have a, a, you know, it's a good question that I think a lot of people have a question about, and that is, what's the best way to engage old school traffic engineers who have final authority over projects but consider the NACTO guide heretical? I think uh, any, I'm going to let any of you uh, jump in on that. Well, I think I think it's how you phrase phrase the question. You know, I think um, you know, I think for any for any public agency, especially with, within cities, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in Portland is how do we make sure we're, we we uh, we have um, a tax base from which to uh, to pay our pensions um, and, and think about it in terms of our even sustainability of our own economic future as a city and and thinking about it in terms of if you if you don't have a tax base if you don't have people in your city you may have a problem moving forward and so that's something that uh, you know you can make the econo economic argument there that um, there's really a need for um, a little self-preservation if you will for those traffic engineers that uh, that um, are uh, are involved in those decisions that we're trying to make uh, we're trying to create spaces where people want to live work and play as opposed to just drive through and so um, those are difficult conversations to have for for uh, the, the engineers that have held on to that belief that their number one job is is to move traffic I think one of the other elements and arguments beyond that uh, beyond that economic one is is a safety element and I, I, I like to I like to say that safety is, um, well, I don't like to say it, I, I, I just honestly believe that safety is our number one job, and, and for those engineers that are um, trying to move traffic at high rates of speed in, in, in a pedestrian environment, boy, that's a, that's a, difficult, that's a difficult spot to be. So um, safety is really, is really paramount, and, and I think that's something that uh, is another argument to say. If we're going um, to make cities that are good places to be and walkable, that, that you got to think about the, the safety of, of, the, uh, of the participants and the, and the people that are, that are there. Okay, thanks. Um, and this is perhaps a follow-up question. Uh, what type of reaction has NACTO and users of the design guide received from the sort of traditional authorities like AASHTO and the ITE? Uh, so somewhat different application of environmental design, uh, environment and, and design perspective. So what kind of reaction are you getting? Uh, Robbie, this is David. I'll answer that question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, definitely in, in sort of looking at the, the sort of the two largest organizations that would sort of make up the, what you, what you kind of refer to as the old guard, um, you know, ITE has been a really good partner, and, and we actually did uh, a webinar with ITE just last week on the guide uh, to engage their membership. Um, part of that is also uh, an effort on our on our part as a coalition of large cities to reach out to city traffic engineers and city officials in smaller cities that may be engaged in uh, in ITE. Um, in terms of Ashto, I think uh, you know. We have an ongoing working group uh, with FHWA, AASHTO, and ITE talking about certain street design issues at, at, at the local level, um, and of which the Urban Street Design Guide is definitely a big part. Um, I will say, you know, I think that um, I think that there's a lot of of work in, to be done in terms of um, ensuring that tools like these are. Um, you know, accepted and understood at the state level, um, but there are definitely a, a growing number of states that have an interest in in learning some urban design and urban street design principles and sort of redefining um, the problem that they're trying 
to solve within urban areas. And I think that that's something that we're seeing more of. Uh, I don't know, um, you know, there's there's three states thus far that have officially recognized the NACTO guides. Um, Georgia DOT incorporated our bike guide into their street, complete streets policy. Uh, Massachusetts DOT uh, in, in, through their uh, healthy uh, transportation initiative. Uh, I may have had the wrong, wrong name there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I believe Washington DOT as well. So, you know, again, that's an ongoing conversation, but definitely one that's, that's gotten um, a lot more interesting since we released the bike guide in 2011. Okay, thanks. Um, actually, this is sort of a, a question that I'm sure a lot of people are wondering. They're, they just want to know if the uh, urban street design guide that's available online contains everything that is in the uh, printed version. So I'll, I'll get this is David again. I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, the online guide contains everything that's in the printed version and actually a little bit more. Um, so again, like I mentioned in my presentation, it's really important for us to sort of see this as a living document. That doesn't mean that the document is going to change frequently. Um, and you know we're going to be recording all of our changes that we do do uh, errata on the site. But mainly, that means that we're going to be uploading case studies. We'll be incorporating new references and photographs as projects come online. Um, and we're going to um, you know, really aim to make the site as, in some ways, an even a better resource than just the, the print document. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and this is sort of an interesting question. How do you balance a climate lens with an equity lens? In Portland, at least, the quickest route to a higher transportation mode split is not the most equitable route. Well, I mean, I think that from an equity standpoint, we are learning a lot as we as we as we contemplate equity more in the in the transportation decisions we make. I think the the, the bike bicycle mode split of twenty five percent is one that uh, it was really done as a part of some of the equity discussions. We're trying to figure out that aspect of design for all users, and and if for a city like Portland, um, you know, dense downtown, but uh, once you leave the the downtown, it's it's a little more um, it's a little more wide open, and and some of those um, some of those longer trips really do get served very well by by bicycle travel. So we're uh, we're cognizant that there are some uh, maybe some challenges related to uh, equity as we as we as we contemplate these improvements that we're making, and that's something that uh, uh, we're we're striving to understand. The, uh, the the groundwork of, uh, of of early urban fabric a lot better. We just had a recent um, implementation of a um, equity atlas from a group that's uh, working here in Portland on uh, the Coalition for Liberal Future is the name of the the group. But uh, and, and they really have been shedding light on some of those aspects that uh, that we're working through to make sure that uh, whenever we do something, we're we're contemplating contemplating both the multimodal transportation benefits, but also uh, the communities, the nature of the communities that we're, we're touching when we, when we make improvements from everything from street lighting to, to traffic signal changes that we're, we're embarking on. OK. Thanks. And we actually have two questions on the same subject um, about the photos in the presentation and the guide. Uh, people wanted to know if they were copyrighted, and someone else asked if government agencies can use the images uh, in the guide in educational materials if they cite the source. Uh, I'll answer that one. Um, people are really welcome to to use the the renderings that we put together in the guide, so long as they cite the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide as the source, and you know that's one of the important sort of aims that, that we actually had in putting this together is that, you know, we don't want people to reinvent the wheel and spend, uh, you know, a ton of money on putting together a whole new set of ref, uh, renderings if, uh, if this is something that can communicate the concept they're trying to get across um, in their project. 
Uh, in terms of actual individual photographs, those um, all have credits attached to them. So just cite the individual credit. Uh, and if there isn't a credit, cite the MACDA Urban Street Design Guide. Great. Well, it was a it was a beautiful. I mean, the the photos were just really dynamic. So I can I can see why a lot of people are asking about that. Um, I was very impressed. Um, and uh, this is a very short question, but I'm sure one that a lot of people wonder: What about parking? <laughs> it looks like you've removed parking in, on a number of streets to have other elements. So people are wondering: What about parking? Uh, this is Mike. I guess I, I'd say three things come to mind. Um, one is it's definitely, you know, data is your friend, and it always should be, and, and I would think the guide underscores that even more. Um, any good decisions should be, should be supported by data. So to the extent that you can gather data, um, even if it's just quick and dirty, better yet to do a full parking or curb utilization study, um, that's a helpful thing. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is, you know, usually, well, depending on the context, if you're in a business area, it's the business owners who are interested about parking or concerned. So it's helpful to have information that might address their concerns um, that you might get from a quick uh, intercept survey of customers um, or, uh, or, or even a, you know, a, a more in-depth study of merchants. New York City DOT will be releasing a study um, in the next month or two with uh, a methodology we developed that helps sort of shed light on the economic impacts. Um, what was the third thing? Uh, I guess from a more practical standpoint, you, you do need to keep emphasizing what the goals are and what the benefits are and, you know, and that there are trade-offs. And people can have concerns about trade-offs and you can have an open discussion about that. But um, at the end of the day, trade-offs do have to be made. So it's all about kind of reaching a consensus on what, what are our goals. Okay. Um, well, I, I have another question that is sort of a equity and affordability question. Uh, some of the design changes seem as though they have an impact on neighborhood affordability. Um, are there examples of cross-agency goal setting or using performance measures that take into account those impacts in the resulting space? Um, I think I, I, I'll take a stab at at least the first part of that, and um, maybe Mike and Peter, if they have any sense of resources out there that may um, kind of take those factors into account, they can share them. Uh, you know, the, the street design guide, uh, I think that when you look at the principles, the, the principles are... Um, you know, their, their goals are really grounded in the notion that streets are public space, but we tend not to treat them that way. Um, and that on top of that, uh, existing urban street design has really been uh, kind of funneled through the highway design lens. And that's something that poses tremendous safety concerns in cities all around the country. Um, and that's something that we as city officials really do need to address. I will say the, you know, when you get into the economics of street design um, and the changes that any individual street design has the potential to bring about in a neighborhood, I think that it, it becomes a conversation that needs to in some ways be divorced from one of uh, sort of physical space only. and. And I, I, would, I would say one of the things that cities can really aim to do to kind of counteract the potential um, economic sort of changes that are brought about by a positive change in our environment in terms of safety and creating public space is to sort of start programs like New York City DOT's Plaza program, which are really targeting areas that have a lack of open space or are underserved. Um, or to work with communities that may not have a bike network or a network of, of, of sidewalks on sort of how to get those things on the ground. So um, I think it's a, a, as much kind of a process uh, and engagement conversation more so than it is sort of, you know, these 
physical spaces that you're showing in the guide are going to touch off um, economic changes in our in our communities. Mike, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think you covered it. I think the bottom line is that all communities of all incomes deserve to have a safe and comfortable and, you know, um, enjoyable public realm if those kinds of improvements, just like any kind of improvement in better schools, you know, um, reduce crime, tend to drive up property values. That is a concern, but it's really sort of a larger concern. Um, uh, so, so the second part of the question is well taken about linkages with, with other agencies. Um, I, on the spot, I, I can't provide a specific example that I'm familiar with, um, but, but I think it's really an important issue and an emerging issue. Uh, you know, it's sort of the next logical step from, first, we just need better streets. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what I'd say to it. Uh, the economic study that we did, you know, one of the conclusions is that these types of improvements help local economies in any neighborhood, not just glitzy retail areas, but basically struggling neighborhood uh, retail shopping areas too. So um, that can be a benefit, but you know, overall affordability issues, um, that gets a little bit beyond my, my wheelhouse. Okay. Well, we, we have a few questions that we didn't cover, but we have uh, gone over quite a bit, and I know that some people have got time constraints. So um, I'm just going to thank uh, our three presenters, once again, this was a fascinating webinar, and I know there's a lot more to come uh, from you guys, and this discussion will continue. Uh, I just want to remind people who are still on the call that if you would like to be reminded of future webinars that SSTI will be putting on, you can subscribe to our newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter. Um, that, those are both up on our screen, and you can subscribe to them from our website at ssti.us. Uh, we do have upcoming webinars in January. We are revising our innovative DOT manual, and we'll be having a discussion about that in January. And then in February, we'll be talking about rethinking the urban freeway. Um, replacing, rebuilding, altering, or otherwise addressing urban freeways. So I think those will both be of interest to a lot of people. So thank you once again for everybody who signed on, and thank you to our presenters. It was great.